This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number double one. 692411. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or manila? Um, we'll have the plain white, please. Uh, but the ones with the little windows. OK. One box, A4, white. Just the one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um, as a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white, then. Something coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets to the pack. All right, let's see. Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists, so can you give us 10 packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. 10 packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Anything else that we can help you with? What do we need? Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right. Floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already and it's a good idea to order early. 
Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't, but could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our cat. Yes, good idea. And, um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, say, put on your own casual clothing, because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now... We don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well, or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, 
whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum, summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, you'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day, we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area, at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. 
Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager, and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. Okay. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project I suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. Oh, I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's... A bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world, and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking, and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes, and... Our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault. It's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. 
Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that, that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester, we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all, as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave... Uh, let me That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecturer talking about the solar eclipse in history. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good evening, and welcome to this month's Observatory Club Lecture. I'm Donald Mackey, and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse when the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day? Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It's the shadow of the moon streaking across the Earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a difference is a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster. And in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job it was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you're superstitious or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they're very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. 
Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it was smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their occurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. It was Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they've since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists... Janssen and Lockyer were observing the sun's atmosphere and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, the sun then Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he'd spotted this so-called lost planet. But, alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he'd been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that, rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he's so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on to the social aspect. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.